Hello and welcome to the Henley and Partners Global Mobility Report webcast series. I'm Juliet Foster and I'm delighted to be your host and moderator for this prestigious series of exclusive interviews with leading international academics and professional experts in the major and emerging trends in global and regional mobility. Grounded in geopolitical analysis and with a focus on the realities shaping our world, from COVID-19 to climate change to economic downturn and ongoing conflict, the Global Mobility Report series offers exclusive insight into mobility and migration patterns and looks at what we can expect in the months to come. Well, joining me today to discuss the latest mobility and migration trends in the United Kingdom and Europe are Madeleine Sumption. She's the director of the Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford and Simone Bartoli, a professor of economics at Université Clermont-Auvergne. So welcome both of you to joining us. Thank you. And let's start first, in fact, with Professor Bertoli, because look, quite a few things are happening, but what are the current problems travellers face when they're moving around the EU? What are the key things that you've noticed? I would say that the main problem nowadays is related to the fact that most destinations within Europe are simply unattractive. So would you would you travel to Paris at the times in which museums, theatres, restaurants are closed and there's a curfew starting at 6 uh, p.m.? So... It's a problem of attractiveness. Uh, we don't currently have, at least for EU nationals, a problem of accessibility. What we had back in the spring when, of 2020, when a number of countries unilaterally decided to close their, their borders. So countries have remained accessible, but travelers do face major difficulties in the sense that I've checked before we started our conversation and today there are just two flights from Paris to Rome, just to give you an idea of how difficult it is to travel around and these flights are mostly empty. So countries have remained accessible legally. Uh, you probably need a, a negative test for admission either than before you you travel or upon arrival. But the problem is that most destinations are unfortunately not really attractive for travelers nowadays. Okay, so given what is happening, is there any evidence that European countries are actually increasing their efforts to coordinate their decision making in this arena? And where are we seeing the benefits? I would say that there are major efforts. And if you want to, to, to get a feeling of the difference, you can just compare the situation today with what happened in March uh, 2020 when uh, countries all of a sudden decide unilaterally to close the borders, something that they had the right to do, but they even didn't notify the European Commission about this. So these decisions were unilateral, not coordinated, and even the reopening, which mostly occurred in June, was not coordinated. So Spain reopened its border with France 15 days before France did the same. So there, was, there were a lot of asymmetries. Today, uh, there are efforts to, to coordinate, for instance, with respect to the mutual recognition of, of viral tests. So you can travel to, to Italy from France and Italian authorities would recognize re the result of the test that you have done before taking your, your plane. Uh, there are efforts to, um, to try to uh, resist any uncoordinated move. There have been exceptions. So, for instance, in September, Hungary decided to close its borders to uh, EU nationals with minor um, exception for citizens from the neighboring countries. But this is the exception rather than the rule. We are seeing effort to, uh, to coordinate, which might even increase over time. So, for instance, there are ongoing discussion with respect to the possible establishment of vaccine passports, so-called vaccine passports, that would allow people that have got a vaccine to travel with fewer restrictions within the European Union. We will see how things unfold. So that's the situation in Europe. But at the same time, in the United Kingdom, Madeleine Sumption, we had Brexit, the big talking point. But now that it's occurred, what is it going to mean for people who want to live and work in the United Kingdom? Well, Brexit has brought big changes to the UK's immigration system. Probably the most important change is the end of free movement. So EU citizens used to be able to come and go from the UK as they wished to live and work here for as long as they wanted and work in any job. Now they will have to meet much more stringent requirements. They'll have to have a job offer lined up in advance. They'll have to meet minimum salary and, and skill requirements. On the other hand, for non-EU citizens, the system is actually becoming uh, a little bit more liberal. 
Um, so, for example, people who want to come and work from outside of, of the EU uh, previously would have had to meet a salary requirement of £30,000. That's going to go down to £25,600. And there is a larger number of jobs that they're allowed to come and work in. Um, so, for example, some of those middle skilled jobs like skilled tradespeople or, or chefs uh, will be eligible, whereas last year they weren't. So overall, you know, it's a more restrictive uh, package in total. Um, but it's uh, particularly more restrictive for EU citizens and more liberal for non-EU. And one of the things the British government was talking about was the tier one investor visa. Now, does that visa mean that applicants can perhaps sidestep some of the bureaucracies and restrictions which may be associated with other permits? Uh, yes, that's right. So if you're coming uh, to work in a particular job and you uh, come on a regular work visa, there's a lot of bureaucracy associated with that. You have to stay in the same job or there's, you know, it's not necessarily totally straightforward to switch to do something new or to do some self-employment on the side. The tier one investor visa up front, there is a fair amount of bureaucracy in that um, there's a lot of paperwork to fill out to show where your funds uh, come from, for example. You have to make a two million pound investment. But after that stage, there aren't uh, a lot of requirements. People can um, you know, live and work here, do whatever they choose. They don't have to work at all if, if they don't want to. So it is um, some people find it attractive for that reason, because um, there, are, there are just fewer requirements than um, after you've arrived than the other work visas would have. And Professor Bottoli, the changes that we're seeing in Europe and indeed in the United Kingdom, they've been happening against this backdrop of COVID-19. Put this into context, just how big a wake up call has COVID-19 been for the European Union? Because it really did look as if at one point the bloc was about to dissolve, implode because of these pressures. I, I totally agree. It has been an enormous wake up call. So uh, again, back in March 2020, we had a feeling with all these uncoordinated and unilateral decisions that the EU was on the verge of dissolving. But, and this is not totally a surprise, it actually came back. Uh, I'm saying that it's not totally a surprise because often time of crisis are times of major changes. There, there's an opportunity for change. And the major one that we have observed is the, the EU recovery plan, which has been financed or is going to be financed with a debt that has been jointly issued by, by, by the, the EU countries, even with dubious legal basis. But something that was uh, even unthinkable just a few weeks before has now has now become possible, and it's a, it's a major achievement. The second major uh, achievement of the EU in the coming in the past months has been the, the the joint negotiation with the pharmaceutical companies with respect to the purchase of the vaccines. This has increased the market power of the EU as a whole, avoided competition across member states, and it has been indeed a major achievement. The third achievement has been that the, the countries in this difficult situation have negotiated the deal with the European, with the United Kingdom, uh, remaining united. And that was not self-evident to begin with. So I would say that it has been a very difficult year, 2020, for uh, the European Union. But in the end, they have achieved something that I think is remarkable. Mm. I mean, you mentioned the word vaccines within the, that answer. And of course, that is where the conversation has now shifted, getting these vaccines rolled out. But isn't it true that until Europe's population is inoculated, it could be years perhaps before the levels of movement within the Schengen zone are actually return to their pre-COVID levels or even get close to that? Unfortunately, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to be uh, optimistic in this respect because it's not just having the European uh, population vaccinated, as you said, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition because it also depends on how uh, the, the vaccines will be deployed in, in the rest of the world. The mobility within the Schengen area also involves a lot of third country nationals. And so when we talk about uh, vaccine passports, we can see the bright side of the story. So people who get vaccinated can uh, more rapidly re re go back to the pre-COVID mobility patterns. But this also means that people who, who are not vaccinated might be prevented from, from moving. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about how long it will take for the entire Schengen area to go back to the pre-COVID mobility patterns. 
Sure. And, and let's stay with this idea of mobility, Madeline, because look, the British government has put in place the Brexit architecture in terms of that movement, getting people to come in, or as the government would say, the right people. But is there any way of predicting how many people are likely to take up any of these options under the new system? Not really, to be honest. I mean, at any time, it's really difficult to forecast migration flows. If you look back 15 or 20 years, for example, people in the UK had no idea that uh, migration from European countries was about to be one of the biggest issues in the UK political debate. These things are just very difficult to forecast. And then particularly now, I mean, look at all of the uncertainty that we have with with COVID, we're introducing a new system at a time of, of total chaos um, as a result of, of the pandemic. We had a collapse in, in migration uh, last year, a little bit of a bounce back with more um, visas being granted um, in, over, over the summer and, and the autumn. But at the moment, I would say things are just really predictable. And so we're, we're going to have to monitor and see what happens. And the government will have to be prepared for a number of different scenarios, either, you know, relatively high demand or probably more plausible um, that the kind of introduction of the system will see initially at least see relatively limited numbers. And Professor Bartoli, very, very briefly, we've heard about the launch of the European Travel Information and Authorization System. It's going to be mandatory in 2023. So how is it going to work? And is it really a big game changer? It's, it's something that is going to be similar to the U.S. ESTA to, 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 to give you a first idea. So it's, uh, it's something that applies to third country nationals that are not subject to, to, to the requirements of a visa for entering the Schengen area. It will allow European authorities in a coordinated and rapid way to do some health and security checks before people are allowed to enter. Uh, whether it's, it's going to be a game changer, it all depends on whether it could also be used to, um, to replace the Schengen visa. So to allow third country nationals to apply in a unified way uh, for, for the visa. Now they have to apply to the country in which they first enter the European Union. So that would facilitate things. I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to be per se a game changer, especially in this difficult context. OK, and very briefly, Madeline, how is COVID-19 affecting the UK's own migration strategy? There have been some quite minor changes, for example, permissions to extend visas where people were unable to leave the country. But broadly speaking, um, the UK government has ploughed ahead with its Brexit plan um, as it had always intended to, uh, introducing it um, uh, in, in December last year um, without making major uh, accommodations as a result of the, the changes brought by the pandemic. OK, well, thank you both for sharing your valuable insights on the regional migration and mobility trends taking place in the United Kingdom and Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you. And thank you to our global audience for your engagement and indeed participation in the Henley and Partners Global Mobility Report Series. Thank you.